All right. Good morning, church family. It's good to be together today. We're so glad um, that we get to gather together as God's family. Um, as you find your seat, just want to welcome you. If you're a visitor, my name is Matt Oaks. I'm an elder candidate here at Gospel Life Church, um, and we're, we're glad that you're here. Uh, we've got a Connect card um, in the seat in front of you on that back right there. You can fill it out if you'd like to to give us more information about yourself, and we can help you get connected to the life of our church, the different ways that we grow in Christ together, whether it's through our uh, gospel communities, uh, through meeting with our pastors, through ways we can pray for you, um, and through our equipped classes. So take some time to fill that out if you'd like, um, and we'll use that to help you get connected to our church. Um, quick reminder, today is Family Sunday. Woo! There it is. Kids, we're glad you're in here with us. We have you in here with us so that we can learn to worship together. So you can watch your parents and other grown-ups worship God and listen to his word together. Um, and we get to be blessed by you. We get to be blessed by your joy. We get to be blessed by your presence, and we're glad you're in here with us. Parents, just want to remind you, your kid is not the only kid making noise, and it's fine. Like, we all make noise. Even when the kids aren't in here, there's always, like, a water bottle that falls, or I laugh too loud, or something happens. Like, there's, it's noisy, right? Like, it's okay. So God put the wiggles in your kids. We're not bothered. And so... We get to worship together today. It's a good thing. And so I just invite you to enjoy that and relax around that. Um, each Sunday, we do like to remind ourselves of our values as a church. These are the things that we say we have to do these things if we're going to live out the mission God has called us to as a church, which is to make disciples, which is to follow the Great Commission. Um, and the one that we're going to look at and just remind ourselves of this morning is the necessity of love. So if someone were to ask you, how do we do things at Gospel Life? There's a lot of ways to answer that, right? Well, we meet on Sundays. We also do gospel communities. Sometimes we do equip classes, we, right? But one of our answers should be, how do we do things at Gospel Life? We do them with love. We do them as acts of love because God has loved us. And we are saying, when we put this, as like it's the necessity of love. We're saying there's no way for us to do our mission outside of doing it in a loving manner. That God, because he is love, has called us to love others like he has loved us. And there's no way to make disciples of a God who describes himself as love in an unloving way. And so we want to remind ourselves of that this morning. As, as we go out into the world, as we worship together, we are called to live out of that love that God has for us and to love others. And that there's no way, it's not bonus, it's not icing on the cake, it's not, okay, if we can squeeze like being loving into this as we go on our mission in the world. No, it's, it is core to who we are. But it's not just love that we're called to. God is love, and he is the one who calls us. God's love is the one who calls us. We're called, as we gather this morning, as we live out our lives, to abide in his love. We're called to hear the good news, to rejoice in it, to be refreshed by it, to, and to be reminded that the, tr the most true thing about you is if, if God has saved you, God loves you. And that is the core of who you are as a person. So let's stand, let me read our scripture that reminds us of God's call to love and his great love for us, and then I'll pray and we'll continue to worship through song. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you are love, that you have loved us, and that you abide in us and, and make it possible for us to abide in you and to abide in your love. 
God, we're grateful for the way that you've saved us and made us your people. We thank you for the way that you forgive us, even when we fall short of this command to love one another as you have loved us. And God, we thank you out of your great love for us that it is your spirit that empowers us to love, your spirit that empowers us to follow you. It's not something you expect us to be able to just muscle through on our own, but God, we thank you that that comes from you. Spirit, we ask that you would shape us, you would form us to be people who love one another, who obey your word, who obey you, and who love as you have loved us. We pray in your name. Jesus says in John 15, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. 
As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch that withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this the Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I love you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. We have the command here to abide in him. But you know the strength and the grace and the wisdom to do that comes from him as well. We are dependent on him to do the very things that he tells us to do. This new song this morning confesses just that. We depend on him for all things great and small. And it is a prayer asking that he would teach us to abide. And my hope for this song is that we would sing it together in corporate worship, but that you would also take it with you and that you would listen to it this week and you would remember it this week. And it would be a a reminder to you for all the many things, great and small, that we are dependent on him for. And that that would allow us to come before his throne with thanksgiving because we realize we can't do any of this alone. And it is through him and by him that we can do these things and we must abide in him. depends on you and I depend on you for the sun to rise for my sleep at night and I depend on you and I depend on you you're the way truth and the light. You're the well that never runs dry. I'm the branch and you are the vine. Draw me close and teach me to
as I enter rest, I depend on you. I depend on you for eternity. To wonder, Lord, I fear. Lord, to leave the God I love is my heart. Take and see, feel it for thy voice above is my before you this morning, confessing, declaring, and rejoicing in the fact that we are utterly and totally dependent on you for all things. So often we walk day to day just doing the same thing over and over again, forgetting that it is you that it is empowering us each step of the way. It is that peace that surpasses all understanding, holding us. Sometimes we forget it's there. I pray that you would remind us, Lord, to abide in you, that you would teach us to abide in you, to rest in you, to follow your commands, to obey you. We depend on you. We love you, Lord. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen, church. Well, it is because of Jesus that we can abide in him. That also gives us fellowship and peace with one another. So let's turn and greet one another with that peace.
right, let's find our places this morning as we prepare to receive God's word. All right, good morning, Gospel Life. You can find your way to your seats if you would. It's so good to see you all here. My name is Tyler. I'm one of the pastors here. I've already met some new folks this morning, but if you are new, I'll be up here along with Matt after the service. We would love to meet you if you're new. And regardless of if you're new or not, we would love to pray with you if you're in need of prayer this morning. If you have a Bible, turn to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Chapter 10. We're starting a new chapter this morning. We have, after this, I think three weeks left. uh, The first three weeks of November, and then we should be done uh, with this book. I hope you've enjoyed our journey through uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. Let me remind you, Uh, that this book was written by one called The Preacher, who is on a journey to understand if meaning or gain can be found in life under the sun. That is life with this horizontal perspective, life without regard for God in the world. And even if one has a regard for God, if one can find gain in in a world that is broken by sin. And what he talked about last week What we've seen the last few weeks is the value of wisdom. This book is part of the wisdom literature in the Bible. And he spoke last week of the value of wisdom, how wisdom is stronger than might. Let me remind you of chapter 9, verse 18, where he says, Wisdom is better than weapons of war. He reminded us and he pointed us to the value of wisdom, but we also talked about some of the limits of wisdom. Today we're going to continue our exploration of what wisdom is, we're going to do so in a bit of a backwards way. So when I was in grad school, I I worked as a bank teller, and we had a a training module on how to spot counterfeit currency, how to spot counterfeit money, and I was very excited about this training module. I thought we were going to learn all kinds of things about counterfeit money. In reality, we, we learned very little about counterfeit money. Instead, we spent most of the time, the majority of the time, almost all of the time, learning about real money, genuine currency. Because there are all kinds of ways to counterfeit money, and counterfeit money could, could take on all kinds of forms. And so they, uh, they sought to teach us, instead of trying to recognize every possible type of counterfeit money, instead to be able to recognize the genuine thing and compare all the counterfeits to that. You see, sometimes in order to understand something, you must study its opposite. And that's the approach that the preacher takes in our passage today. To understand wisdom, to really grasp it and see the value of it, we're going to study its opposite. And what is the opposite of wisdom? The opposite of wisdom is foolishness or folly. He sought before to understand wisdom in this way. The very first chapter, chapter 1, verse 17, he says, I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. You see, this was his pursuit. To understand wisdom, he sought to understand its opposite, namely madness and folly. And so the preacher sees fit to explore the nature of foolishness in order to understand wisdom. In order to understand wisdom and to more fully protect against 
folly and protect wisdom from what we talked about last week. It's vulnerability. In our passage today, we learn about the nature of foolishness. So if you would stand with me, let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verses 1 through 15. We'll see the nature of foolishness and thus understand the nature of wisdom. The preacher says this, starting in verse 1, chapter 10. Dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give off a stench, so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. A wise man's heart inclines him to the right, but a fool's heart to the left. Even when the fool walks on the road, he lacks sense, and he says to everyone that he is a fool. If the anger of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your place, for calmness will lay great offense to rest. There is an evil I have seen under the sun, as it were an error proceeding from the ruler. Folly is set in many high places, and the rich sit in low place. I have seen slaves on horses and princes walking on the ground like slaves. He who digs a pit will fall into it, and a serpent will bite him who breaks through a wall. He who quarries stones is hurt by them, and he who splits logs is endangered by them. If the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength, but wisdom helps one succeed. If the serpent bites before it is charmed, there is no advantage to the charmer. The words of a wise man's mouth win him favor, but the lips of a fool consume him. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is evil madness. A fool multiplies words, though no man knows what is to be, and who can tell him what will be after him. The toil of a fool wearies him, for he does not know the way to the city. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your wisdom, your wisdom that you have given us in your word and your wisdom that you have sent to us in the person of Jesus. Lord, I pray that this morning we might recognize our deep need for you as we just sang about our deep dependence upon you for wisdom. Lord, we are so prone to wander. We are so prone to go our own way We are so prone to follow our own foolish hearts. Lord, would you teach us to reject the way of foolishness and embrace the wisdom that comes through Christ. Lord, I pray for anyone here who does not know Jesus, who is going through life trusting in themselves, that is their own foolish way of life. Would you enable them by your grace this morning to turn from trusting in their own sinful way of life and enable them to trust In Jesus, the wisdom of God this morning. Lord, for those who do know you, I pray that you would enable them to turn from the foolish tendencies that they still have and enable all of us, by the power of Christ within us, to follow your way of wisdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as a church that has benefited from some of the ideas that came out of the Reformation. This weekend, I am contractually obligated to quote a reformer. Uh, If you're not aware, tomorrow is Reformation Day, and if you think it's some other day, uh, you're likely a a more fun individual, but um, it is Reformation Day tomorrow, so let me give you a quote from a reformer in regard to this passage. This passage that we're going to study today, many have been confused by this passage because if you didn't notice, this, it, it has a different tone, it has a different pace, namely, it has a different order in that it doesn't seem to have an order. And Martin Luther, in speaking of this text, he says, I think very kindly, he says, the preacher makes some really harsh transitions here. And maybe you felt that way as we were reading it. You might say, what's the main point of this? He's going every which way. He's talking about ointments and flies and snakes and axes and rulers What's he talking about? Many have struggled, many Bible teachers have struggled to try to organize this text in a nice, neat, and concise way, and they've been frustrated by it. You see, what we have in chapter 10 here, and we'll see it next week as well, is something that reflects more the the wisdom of the Proverbs. And if you remember, when we studied the Proverbs, we talked about how preaching the Proverbs or studying the Proverbs is difficult because it's not organized well. 
And I say that, right, recognize it is the word of God inspired by God, right? But we wish it were organized differently, right? Especially as a preacher, when I preach through Proverbs, I remember thinking that. Because the Proverbs have all kinds of wise things to say about everyday life. It, the Proverbs talk about money and relationships and work and laziness and all kinds of things. But they're not organized into nice, neat categories. You could read any chapter of the Proverbs and all of a sudden you're talking about relationships. And then you're talking about money. And then you're talking about work. And then you're talking about relationships again. And then you're talking about food. And then you're back to work. It's all over the place. You can have a bit of whiplash reading the Proverbs. And maybe you feel like that with our passage today. And as we said when we studied the wisdom of Proverbs, there's an inherent wisdom to its order. Because the order or the apparent randomness of the Proverbs reflects the apparent randomness of everyday life. The everyday life for which we need wisdom. You see, life doesn't come to you or come at you in a neat, organized way. It's not like you can write in your schedule tomorrow, okay, from 4 o'clock to, it's 4 in the morning, right? You're, you're going to get after it from 4 o'clock to 9 o'clock. I'm going to really focus on finances. And then from 10 o'clock to whatever, I'm going to focus on people and my relationships. And then from this time to this time, I'm going to get to work because it's already out of the afternoon by now. No, life doesn't work in that way, right? You can be in the middle of work and all of a sudden you get a phone call about a difficult relationship, a difficult family situation. You can be right in the middle of dinner with your family and you get a call from a creditor and now you have to think about money, right? Life comes at us in seemingly random ways and wisdom teaches us to navigate the seemingly random nature of life. And we see something similar in this passage today. But I would argue that this passage does have a main point. This passage talks about something over and over and over again. In fact, nine times it mentions the word fool or foolishness or folly. Every verse that we talked about either mentions or relates to the issue of foolishness. And just like the Proverbs, when we encounter foolishness, it comes at us in all kinds of areas of our lives, and we encounter it in all kinds of ways. And if we are to grow in wisdom, we must be prepared for the randomness of life. The randomness of scenarios reflected in this passage reflect the randomness of our real lives. And when I say randomness, I mean under God's control, but it seems random to us. And we're met with all kinds of examples of folly and foolishness throughout our lives, and we must be equipped to walk wisely through them. The main point, again, is that of foolishness. And as I mentioned at the beginning, our desire is to walk straight through this passage this morning. I'm not going to try to break it up in a fancy way. We're just going to walk straight through it, and we're going to observe the nature of foolishness in its various aspects that we see in this passage. And you might say, well, why are we studying foolishness? Once again, we're studying the nature of foolishness so that we might be wise. We're studying the nature of foolishness so that we might understand its opposite, that is wisdom. So let's get started. Let's look. Verse 1, dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give off a stench So a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. This is the first point. Kids, you can write this down. Ask your folks how to spell it. I can't tell you. I I just have to read my own writing, but write it down. First, foolishness is potent. Potent. It's potent, right? Dead flies. You could get some nice perfume or ointment, and you open it up, and it doesn't smell like lavender or pumpkin spice or whatever it's supposed to smell like. Why? Because there's a bug in there and it rotted in there and it caused the ointment to ferment and stink. We saw last week how wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. You see, yes, wisdom as a whole is better and it is stronger than foolishness, but foolishness, folly, is, is more potent. Just a little bit of folly will mess up a whole lot of wisdom. For example, you could have 10 smart folks in a room. 10 smart folks in a room, right? All it takes is one dumb dumb <laughs> to walk in. Especially a confident dumb dumb, right? 
and you bring down the intelligence of the whole group, right? You, you understand, you've been in meetings, right? Uh, by the way, if you miss the meeting and the team comes up with brilliant ideas, um, that should give you a clue to what's happening. You won't get it because you're the guy, right? But foolishness is potent. One fool, one fool in a group can bring down the intelligence of the whole. I like to, when I'm up here, I like to drink water because my mouth gets dry, and so I drink water. And I drink it out of cups like this sometimes, right? And so this is a, a cup, and these are great, right? They keep things cool, they keep things hot, they keep things room temperature if you want that, which is the way this is right now. Uh, and these things are great at that, but they also make excellent fly traps. I don't know if you've noticed. There's a little opening here, and a fly just loves to crawl in there. But then they can't find their way out, and they drown in the liquid. And especially if you have a darker liquid like coffee or something, you can be drinking, and it could be the best cup of coffee you ever had. But you get down to the bottom, and it's bottoms up time, and all of a sudden there's something crunchy. And it ruins the whole experience. The whole cup of coffee, you're nauseated. You were just drinking coffee with a fly just marinating in it the whole time. So we understand this, right? Foolishness is potent, just like fly, one fly in a vat of ointment. It's potent. What else? Verse 2. A wise man's heart inclines him to the right, but a fool's heart to the left. Some of you just found your life verse. (laughs) Is this the new verse? Is Is this the new slogan of the GOP, right? It could be. It, it could be just as much as Acts 2 verse 1 is an advertisement for Honda. You know, the one that says that the disciples were all together in one accord, right? So that same kind of, the same, if, same interpretation, integrity of interpretation, if you want to use it that way, we would apply to that. But no, this is, this is not talking about the political right and the political left as much as we might want it to be. You're like, I already ordered the bumper sticker. Just, okay, it's not. It's not talking about that. But it is talking about two opposite directions. And foolishness and wisdom, they lead in two opposite and opposed directions. And many have looked at this verse and noted that there is a moral overtone to it. A man's heart inclines him to the right and a fool's heart to the left. In the Bible as a whole that There are moral overtones to these two directions. That to the right is the place of favor, and to the left is the place of disfavor. You can remember when Jesus said he would separate the sheep from the goats, the sheep would be placed on his right, but the goats on his left. You see what we can discern about folly from this verse is not only is folly potent, but foolishness leads astray. It leads astray, and there is a progression to more and more foolishness. Third, foolishness is self-evident. A fool makes himself or herself known. Verse 3, even when the fool walks on the road, he lacks sense, and he says to everyone that he is a fool. Even when he's just walking down the road, everyone knows he's a fool. Foolishness makes itself known. You can spot a fool coming from a mile away. And you see that it it shows up related to verse 2. It shows up in one's walk. That even when a fool walks on the road, he lacks sense. And he says to everyone, he's a fool. Now, I don't think he's verbalizing this, right? But it's just like he's walking down the road saying, I'm a fool, I'm a fool, I'm a fool. You observe a fool's life. And that's what it declares You see fools make themselves known. If you observe the life of a fool, decisions they make, the way they talk, the things they post about, the way they handle hardship, fools make themselves known. One of the ways fools make themselves known is they have no idea that they are declaring to the world that they are a fool. Fools lack self-awareness. Fools are full of pride. In fact, to a fool, everyone else is a fool except for me. So often, the fool is one who gives himself to 
Things like gossip and slander, which is attacking speech or constantly complaining about all the fools around him. This is the mark of a fool. When we consider leaders in the church, one thing we do, one qualification is that we, or one, one part of the process is that we observe them, right? Because over time, fools make themselves known. And it's important that we do so because we'll see in the next few verses that it's dangerous when fools are in positions of power. Let's look at verse 4. If the anger of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your place, for calmness will lay, lay great offenses to rest. Here we can see that foolishness is irrational and it is irritable. See, we'll return to the, the ruler that we talked about last week in verse 17 of chapter 9. Where we read, the words of the wise heard in quiet are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. You remember that confident, foolish ruler who's shouting among a, amongst a crowd of fools. We return to this ruler, and here this ruler is angry. This ruler is angry, and he is irrational. So what if you find yourself as an advisor to a foolish ruler, or a foolish boss, or a foolish leader? What do you do? What do you do when his anger rises against you? Well, he tells us what not to do. One, you shouldn't just leave, right? We talked about that in, in chapter 8. Don't just run away. But it's very important. It's very important that you not leave your place, but that you let your answer be calm. He says, for calmness or healing will lay great offenses to rest. It's important when you're met with an angry, irritable foolish ruler or boss or whatever it is, authority figure, that you don't match his or her energy and then try to argue rationally. No, you use wisdom and you give rational, logical advice, yes, but the importance here and the emphasis here is on your demeanor. Don't run away, but also don't rush. Be calm. Be calm. Be calm. Because he won't hear you if you match his anger. If you match his anger and speak logically, his anger will only increase. But if you can bring calm, winsomeness to the situation, healing can be brought. We see this in the Proverbs. The preacher here is echoing some of the wisdom of the Proverbs. This is Proverbs 15, verse 1. A soft answer turns away wrath. But a harsh word stirs up anger. It says nothing about whether they're wise or foolish words, but it's talking about demeanor here, right? A, a soft answer, a calm, confident, quiet, peaceable answer turns away wrath. But a harsh word, no matter how correct, will only stir up anger. We see also in Proverbs 25:15. With patience, a ruler may be persuaded, and a soft tongue will break a bone. A soft tongue will break a bone. See, we're not talking about weakness. We're talking about wisdom. You match the ruler's anger and bravado with a soft, calm, wise answer. And you may bring healing to the situation. You may bring calmness, and you may find the offenses laid to rest. You see, stay put if possible. If you find yourself in the position where you are an advisor or an employee of a foolish leader, you might be tempted to run away, as we talked about in chapter 8, or as it says here, but you should, if possible, stay put. Because maybe you can help, and you should help if you can, because a fool in power is a very dangerous Thing. We see that in verses 5 through 7. He says, There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, as it were, an error proceeding from the ruler. So he calls this evil. He says he's seen something evil, and it's evil when it's really bad when an error comes from a ruler. And what is this error? He says in verse, he explains it in verses 6 and 7. Folly is set in many high places, and the rich sit in a low place. I have seen slaves on horses and princes walking 
on the ground like slaves. What situation, what error is he talking about here? Well, we might be troubled by these verses, but let me explain that this is in the tradition of Proverbs. These are not talking necessarily about social categories, but rather moral categories. You see the the fool, that's self-explanatory, but the slave is likely someone who is a criminal or a debtor who is paying off their debt through this kind of servitude. Likewise, the prince is not someone who just a prince because of their bloodline or their privilege, but someone who is a prince because of their, no- their noble character. The rich is not here someone who has stolen or the, the foolish uh, person who's inherited great wealth, but someone who through wisdom and a track record of wisdom has earned prosperity. And so what we have here is the, the error of the foolish leader is that he doesn't necessarily put the qualified in positions of power. Instead of those who are rich in wisdom and noble in character being put in positions of power, it is the fools and the criminals. Now why are they put in those kinds of positions of power? Likely it's because they're the yes men and the yes women. They're the ones who will affirm the so-called wisdom of the foolish leader. And this causes chaos. We see here that foolishness, especially in positions of power, is disruptive and it is chaotic. It results in an upside-down world. We can certainly think of this in the political sphere as this seems to be describing, but you've likely experienced this in your life. So let's say you work for a company Uh, that has just had a hostile takeover, right? And there's new leadership at the company. And your job, you're an accountant at the company. You've been there for the last seven years. And you've reported historically to the CFO named Mike. Mike is the CFO. Now, Mike is a tough boss, but he's a fair boss. Tough but fair. And he's got a lot of experience, Right, He worked in, the, in public accounting for 10 years, and in the last 10 years he's been the CFO of this company. He has a wise track record. He's a careful, wise, tough but fair boss. And the new president who's just taken over doesn't like Mike, intimidated by Mike, so he gets rid of Mike and he replaces him with Gary. Who's Gary? You say that to the president. Who's Gary? He's like, Gary's my college buddy. Does he have any qualifications? No, but he's a great time. He's a good time. Good, good guy, that Gary. Did he get his degree? Is he a CPA? Is he good? No, but he didn't really finish college. But you, you'll like Gary. He's a, he's a real out-of-the-box thinker. You're like, oh, great. That's what you want as a CFO, out-of-the-box. And so you meet with Gary. You bring him the last five years of financial statements, and you put them on his desk, and he's like, yeah, bro, I appreciate that. And he puts his hand on them, just kind of moves them aside, and you have an idea that those are never getting looked at again. He's like, I don't really like to live in the past, man. I'm a, I'm a forward thinker. And, you know, I've been looking around, and you know what I'm not singing? Ping pong. No ping pong table. Back in my fourth year as a sophomore at, in the Alpha Pi house, we had our best ideas around the ping pong table. I think that's what we need here. You've seen this, right? The foolish leader puts his best friends or her best friends in charge regardless of their qualifications. And often, those who are wise and most qualified are passed over. And it's harmful on a large scale. It's destructive. It's chaotic. It's disruptive on a large scale. And foolishness is is disruptive and chaotic on a large scale. But it's also personally dangerous and self-destructive. And that's what we see in verses 8 through 11. In verses 8 through 11, the preacher describes four accidents. So let's look at them. First, verse 8. He who digs a pit will fall into it, and a serpent will bite him who breaks through a wall. So what's he describing here? Well, I think he's describing a fool who's up to no good. And that's what fools do, right? Fools are always up to no good. And what's this fool doing? Well, I think he's echoing some of the, this illustration is used often in the wisdom literature. In fact, it's seen seen in the Psalms. 
and a wise preacher would have marked it, but it's Psalm 7. We'll get there. Psalm 7. There's a lot of Psalms. Psalm 7, all right, Psalm 7, 14 through 16. It should already be up on the screen. This is what the psalmist writes. He says, behold, the wicked man, so this is an evil man, up to no good, right? The wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. And this is what he does. He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head. And on his own skull, his violence descends. And so I think these, the, the preacher here is echoing that sentiment. So the one who digs a pit is likely trying to trap someone. Digging a pit and camouflaging it, hoping, hoping that his enemy will fall into it. But he digs the pit and he camouflages it. And then he forgets where it is and he steps on it and he falls in the pit. Because he's a fool. Foolishness is self-destructive. A serpent will bite him who breaks through a wall. This is likely someone trying to break into someone's home. And in this area, the, the brittle mortar it made a great place for tiny poisonous snakes. I was reading about all the different kinds of poisonous snakes in this region. And there was all kinds of them, and they like to hide in the mortar in certain walls. So a fool who's trying to break into someone's house, who's not careful because he's a fool, ends up getting bit in the process. So you see these two accidents that happen to this foolish mischievous person, we see the, the point seems to be that foolishness is self-destructive. It's personally dangerous. But then verse 9 describes just general accidents that could happen to anyone. We read in verse 9, he who, he who quarries stones is hurt by them, and he who splits logs is endangered by them. So someone who's quarrying stones, right, shaping giant stones perhaps to build a wall may be hurt by them. And he who splits logs, right, who has an axe is splitting logs that can perhaps splinter and fly into his eyes or hurt someone else. And there seem, even though these are accidents that might befall anyone, the implication here seems to be that the fool is more prone to these kinds of accidents. Why? Perhaps, as we'll see, it's because the fool is impatient and unobservant. Those are the, uh, the next attributes of foolishness. Foolishness is impatient and unobservant. That's what we see in verses 10 and 11. Verse 10, think of the one who's splitting logs. What does he use? He uses an iron axe. And we read in verse 10, if the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength, but wisdom helps one succeed. You see, the fool just keeps on chopping doesn't matter that the axe is dull, just keeps on chopping. The fool is impatient, doesn't have time to sharpen the axe, unobservant, maybe he doesn't even notice. But you see, fools, generally speaking, they don't respect the limits of things. Fools don't, ex they don't respect the limits of things like tools. They don't respect the the limits of other people. They don't even respect the limits of themselves. You see, a fool will never stop to rest or ask for directions or to think. The fool doesn't have time to examine and sharpen his tool. The fool just continues to hack away with a dull tool and a dull mind, wearing himself out and apparently getting hurt in the process. We see the impatient fool in verse 11, if the serpent bites before it is charmed, there is no advantage to the charmer. You can imagine a snake charmer, right? This is a skill. Apparently people still do this. A snake charmer is someone with the talent to kind of hypnotize a snake, right? That's a pretty cool talent, right? But it takes time. It takes effort. And so imagine a snake charmer who comes into an area where there's uh, there's been seen this deadly cobra, but he is a skilled but impatient snake charmer. You don't want that guy, right? Because he comes in, like the patient snake charmer comes in, sees the snake and does the thing, right? We've all sit with the, the flute and does the real patient and the snake kind of gets lulled into a sense of safety and doesn't really know what's going on and gets really calm and then the snake charmer can pick it up and put it in the basket, right? There's always a basket, right? Puts it in the basket, puts the lid on. 
the impatient snake charmer just kind of comes up and da 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 okay, I think it's good, picks it up, gets bit. Doesn't ha- matter how much knowledge or skill he or she has, it's canceled out by impatient folly. Next, foolishness is talkative. It's talkative. Foolishness is talkative. If you read the Proverbs, it talks about our speech and our foolish speech. Speech is mentioned in every single chapter of the Proverbs, and it's no different here. The preacher uses several verses to talk about the talkative nature of foolishness. Verse 12, the words of a wise man's mouth win him favor, but the lips of a fool consumes him. You see, the wise words, the the words like the advisor to the king in verse 4, it wins favor calms people down. It it brings out a certain graciousness in other people. But a fool, a fool just keeps talking and talking and talking and makes himself known the more he talks. Verse 13, the beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness and the end of his talk is evil madness. The foolishness just grows as the fool talks. The more and more he talks, the worse it gets. You see, the fool starts a sentence with no idea where it's going. And it ends up in evil madness. And it ends up being very self-evident that he or she is a fool. You see, fools love to talk because fools love the sound of their own voice. Plato said this, that wise men speak because they have something something to say. Fools speak because they have to say something. Foolishness is often talkative. We see in verse 14 that foolishness is confident. It's confident, but it's based on nothing. It's baseless confidence. A fool multiplies words, we see in verse 14. Though no man knows what is to be and who can tell him what will be after him. The fool just multiplies words, keeps talking and talking and talking about things that he he doesn't know. Ecclesiastes has made it clear over and over that no one knows the future, no one but God. But the fool thinks that he is the exception. He knows. He knows what's going to happen and you should trust him. And he assures with baseless confidence of what will be or what won't be, what will happen or what won't happen. And this is dangerous in a leader because foolish people love this kind of foolish leader. You remember last week, the crowd of fools that gather in awe around the foolish shouting of the ruler. Fools love this kind of baseless confidence because it makes us feel safe. We say, you know, we don't know what's going to happen, but he seems like he knows. He says he's going to make it great again, or he's going to build it back better, whatever it is, right? But he, he knows, so we can just rest, because he seems so confident. You see, we love these kinds of leaders because they take the pressure off of us. They make us feel safe. We say there's no need for me to change or pursue wisdom, because that guy knows. He sounds, I mean, look how confident he seems. And when that foolish leader lets us down, we just move on to one who is all the more confident, all the more charismatic. Just like a fool in a crowd, we hope in the shouts of a fool. Lastly, verse 15, foolishness is tiresome. Maybe you're tired right now. We just talked all about all, all this stuff about foolishness. Maybe you're tired, right? And ultimately, foolishness is tiresome. Verse 15, last verse. The toil of a fool wearies him, for he does not know the way to the city. The toil, his work, it wears him out, for he does not know the way to the city. The city is presumably the place where the fool works, but he's worn out before he even gets there because he keeps getting lost and he's talking and boasting the whole way. And so we see these attributes of foolishness. We've seen that foolishness is potent and it leads us astray and it's self-evident, it's irrational, it's irritable, it's disruptive, it's chaotic, it's impatient, it's self-destructive, it's unobservant. We see all of these things. It's talkative, it's confident, it's tiresome. But there's one last attribute that's important. Foolishness, and we're almost done. 
foolishness is universal. Foolishness is universal. You see verse 2, it says, A wise man's heart inclines him to the right or the right way, but a fool's heart to the left or the foolish way. You see, it starts with the heart. The walk of the fool begins in his heart. It begins in her heart. Foolishness, folly, begins with our hearts, and all of us are born with sinful, foolish hearts that lead us down the path of destruction. Isaiah says it this way in Isaiah 53, verse 6. He says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. We're fools at heart. And we go our own way. We think, just like dumb sheep, we think we know the best way to go. And we turn astray. Every one of us. Every one of us. You see, our foolish hearts, they're proud. They're self-confident. They claim that we know the way and it's better than any other way. It's even better than God's way. And this is the way it's been since the beginning. In the garden, in Genesis 3, 6, we read that so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. You see, she and Adam, they wanted to be wise. They didn't trust in the leadership of God. They wanted to go their own way, and they thought they would gain their own wisdom, which turned out to be foolishness. And now every child of Adam has a foolish heart. Now every child of Adam rejects the wisdom of God for our own foolish way. You see, in our hearts, our foolish hearts are darkened and we claim to be wise, as Romans 1 says. We claim to be wise, but we become fools. We exchange the glory and the wisdom of God for created things. And notice it says that we we claim to be wise. Fools are full of pride and we lack self-awareness. Fools consider themselves uniquely wise amongst a sea of fools. And I need you to hear me. Maybe, maybe you're sitting here and that's the way you listened to this sermon. Maybe you listened to this sermon thinking of all the ridiculous, foolish people around you. You, the uniquely wise one, You see, that kind of delusional self-confidence is one of the chief markers of a foolish, sinful heart. And I need to tell you that if you remain in that state, if you remain in that state of assuming that everyone around you is a fool, and yet you are the one who is truly wise, you are the one who knows the right way, if you remain in that state, you will continue on your own way, and you will never embrace the wisdom of God. And the Bible's clear that that way leads to destruction. You see, we talked about last week that the wisdom of God is embodied in Jesus Christ and it is displayed most clearly in Jesus' work to save foolish sinners like you and me. But if you consider yourself wise, the only wise one amongst a sea of fools, if you consider yourself wise, you will never come to Jesus You will never consider the wise plan of salvation. Instead, you will consider it to be utter foolishness itself. You see, a prerequisite of receiving God's salvation is recognizing yourself to be foolish and recognizing your own way to be a foolish and destructive way. But the good news is this, is that if by God's grace you see it, If by God's grace you see your own sin and you see your own foolishness, then you will turn to Jesus who is the embodiment of the wisdom of God. We looked at some of this passage last week. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll look first at verse 18 where we read that the the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. Those who are perishing, those who are on their own foolish way, they look at the cross and they they say, I don't need that. 
I don't need a savior who failed. I'm a, I'm a success. I can succeed on my own. They look at the word of the cross and they consider it to be foolishness. But to us who are being saved by it, it is the power of God. If God gives you the ability to see your own destructive foolishness, you can look at the cross and see the wisdom of God, the saving plan of God. We read in verse 27 through 30 that God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low, low and despised in the world even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. My encouragement to you is if you are trusting in your own foolish way of life, turn from trusting in that way of life and trust in the wisdom of God. Because the rest of that verse in Isaiah, it says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see, Jesus died on the cross, not for his sin, he had none. Not for his foolishness, he was the wisdom of God incarnate. He died on the cross for your sin and my sin, for your foolishness, for my foolishness. He died for my foolish, wayward heart and my foolish, wayward walking. And so turn and trust in what he has done to pay the penalty for your foolishness. If you have trusted in Jesus... You are now united to Jesus, which means you are united to the wisdom of God incarnate. And you now have the power of Christ living within you, which means you now have the power by the Holy Spirit to grow and walk in wisdom. And so my call to you is to consider these attributes of foolishness and ask yourself, are any of these things true of my life now? And where can I turn from my own foolish way and walk by the power of Christ in the way of wisdom? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word that shines a light on our hearts, even the areas of our hearts that we like to keep concealed from the world around us. Lord, we, as we just sang about, we're all prone to wander. We're all prone to go our own way. We're all prone to follow the path of our own foolish pride. Lord, we love to espouse our own ideas and our own confident assertions about things that we think. God, left to ourselves, we will destroy ourselves with our own folly. We thank you for Jesus who came to rescue us in the midst of our foolish state. We thank you for the grace to see what he has done, not as foolishness, not as failure, but rather victory and strength and salvation. So Lord, I pray for anyone here who is still trusting in their own way of life. Lord, looking at those around them, seeing them go down their own foolish way, but thinking that they alone are on the right path, the way of victory, the way of life. Lord, would you show them the dead end nature of the path that they're on. Help them to repent before you and turn from trusting in their own sinful, foolish way of life and to trust instead in the work of Jesus. We thank you that Jesus became sin for us. He became our own foolishness for us so that we might become the righteousness and wisdom of God. And so, Lord, I pray for my friends in this room who have trusted in the work of Jesus. Would you now enable us by the power of Christ within us to turn from everyday foolishness that we're still tempted to walk in and instead walk in the way of wisdom. Help us to walk in the way of Jesus. I pray this in your name. Amen. We're now going to come to the table and participate in this meal of communion. This meal that reminds us of the work of Jesus this meal that reminds us that Jesus, the very wisdom of God, took our foolish sin upon him. 
and his body was broken and his blood was shed, not for his sin, but to absorb the wrath of God that was due my sin and your sin. And so if your faith is in Jesus, let me encourage you to come forward, take a cup and take the bread, take it back to your seat, and we'll come back up and take us, and, and I will lead us in taking this meal together. If you're not a Christian, once again, I would encourage you not to take part in this meal. It will do nothing for you. Instead, take Christ. Turn from trusting in your own way of life and trust in Jesus, the wisdom of God, who has become to us salvation, wisdom, and redemption. Let's stand together. We'll participate together. I'll come back up and lead us in taking the meal in a moment. Yeah. 
our Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the work of Christ until he returns. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this tangible reminder of your wisdom. Lord, with this tangible reminder of Jesus, the wisdom of God, who came and lived the life of wisdom that we should have lived but do not, and died the death that we sinners, we foolish sinners deserve, so that we might not have to. And so I pray for deep confidence in the work of Jesus. Lord, I pray for deep confidence, not in ourselves, not in our own pride or intellect, but in you, Jesus. We thank you that you took our foolishness upon you and you set our feet on your path, on the path of righteousness, on the path of eternal life. And so, Lord, I pray that we might delight in your goodness and your grace toward us in the remaining remaining part of this service. Lord, that we might delight in your grace. Lord, that what looks like foolishness and folly to the world is the very wisdom of God, our salvation through Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that you might enable us to identify those areas of foolishness that still remain, those areas of foolish self-confidence, those areas of foolish talk and bravado, Lord, those areas where we are leading others in chaotic and destructive ways. Lord, I pray that you would enable us by your grace to turn from trusting in those things and instead trust in you, Jesus. Knowing that the very power of God that raised Jesus from the dead is within us, enabling us to walk in the way of wisdom. So Lord, show us what that looks like in the coming days, even today, and during these next songs. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue to worship God for his goodness and grace toward us. You'll have the opportunity to worship through singing. You'll also have the opportunity to worship through giving uh, during the chorus of this next song. So let's worship him together.
temptation comes my way. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope instead. Declare that church. So teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way. And when I cannot stand, that to you this morning. We need you. Bless us as we go through this week. Remind us of our need for you. Remind us to abide in you. Teach us. We love you, Lord, in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God for how he meets us in our need for him. I've got just a couple of announcements as we wrap up this morning. Again, if you are a visitor and you filled out one of those Connect cards, you can put it in that give box in the back, or you can hand it to Tyler or I. We'd love to help you get connected to our church more, um, so feel free to do that. We'd also love to meet you, so if you wanted to come, uh, Tyler and I will be up front. Also, if anyone would like prayer this morning, Tyler and I will also be happy to pray with you. Uh, a couple things coming up this week. Uh, Impact Community Church interest meeting. Woo! No one whoops, so I wooed. All right, November 2nd, 630 to 8 p.m. It's going to be at the, Nathaniel, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on which hotel it's at. Hampton, right? Hampton on 46. All of that information is on the church app or the church website where you can also register to let Nathaniel know that you're coming. Encourage you to go. If you did not make it to the last interest meeting, we encourage you to go to this one to hear more about the vision for Impact Community Church, the, the church that Pastor Nathaniel is planting out of here. And so uh, make sure you do that if you haven't had a chance yet. Or speak to him and get more information about him. We're excited for what God is doing through that. Uh, two kind of quick schedule things for everyone to know. As a reminder, if you've been part of the Women's Equip class, it is not meeting this Monday. Instead, you're going to be celebrating Reformation Day separately <laughs> or Halloween. Um, I'm kidding. Uh, Halloween's fun. Uh, also, because some of you are, I'm, I know, are planners and have looked at the calendar, Christmas is on a Sunday, which is awesome. Yes. Woo, indeed. Um, <laughs> It's way more fun to celebrate birthdays on the days they happen, right? And so, like, we're going to be gathering on Sunday. I just want you to know we're still having our church gathering. We're going to be celebrating Jesus coming to earth as a person for the purpose of saving us from sin on Christmas. So since some of you all are planners and want to know, that is happening. So just wanted to let you know about that. If you'll stand with me, I'm going to read our benediction. This is from James 3. Um, as I read this scripture, I want us to be reminded and challenged to, to pursue not worldly wisdom, not wisdom that, that is bold and brash that causes strife and pain in our world, but the kind of wisdom that Jesus gives us, wisdom that leads to peace. Here it is from James 3. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his, his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, 
gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Go in the wisdom that God gives us through Christ and go to be people who sow a harvest of righteousness and peace. Have a great Sunday.